This video presents demonstrations supporting the SIGGRAPH 98 paper entitled NeuroAnimator, Fast Neural Network Emulation and Control of Physics-Based Models. This animation demonstrates the emulation of a passive dynamic system. The upper left display shows a numerically simulated physical model of a multilink pendulum swinging freely in gravity. The other display shows trained pendulum neuroanimators faithfully emulating the physical model. Each emulator was trained with super time steps corresponding to 25, 50 and 100 simulator time steps. The scenario here is similar to the previous animation, except that the multilink pendulum is now an active dynamic system. An external controller excites the system with random motor torques at its joints. The emulators react to the same excitation in a physically correct manner. In this demonstration, the yellow arrow indicates external forces that are applied to the passive dynamic model. The three trained neural network emulators react to the same forces in a physically correct manner. This animation shows the physical model of the lunar lander and its emulator responding to the same random control inputs. We show two separate control sequences, each having 8,000 physical simulation steps. This animation shows the situation analogous to the previous one, but for the truck model. The far dolphin is animated by simulating a mechanical model actuated by internal muscle actions. The near dolphin is animated by a neural network that emulates the physical model at much less computational cost. The control inputs to the network, muscle forces, are identical to those for the mechanical model. Note the similarity of the motions. This animation shows the progress of the control learning algorithm for the three-link pendulum. The purple pendulum, animated by a neuroanimator, has as its goal to end the simulation with zero velocity in the position indicated by the green pendulum. We make the learning problem very challenging by setting a limit on the internal torques of the pendulum, so that it cannot reach its target in one step, but must swing back and forth to gain the momentum to reach its goal. This animation illustrates the response of the physical model of the pendulum to the emulator synthesized controller from the previous animation. This animation shows the lunar lander neuroanimator learning a soft landing maneuver. The translucent lander resting on the surface indicates the desired position and orientation of the model at the end of the animation. Minimal velocity upon landing is an additional requirement. This animation illustrates the response of the physical model of the ship to the emulator synthesized controller from the previous animation. This animation shows the truck neuroanimator learning to park. The translucent truck in the background indicates the desired position and orientation of the model at the end of the simulation.
This animation illustrates the response of the physical model of the truck to the emulator synthesized controller from the previous animation. This animation shows the dolphin learning to swim. Its objective is to move as far forward as possible in a fixed time period. Since the neuroanimator control learning algorithm uses a strongly directed, gradient-based search to explore the control space, the efficient locomotion pattern can be discovered much more quickly compared to the use of stochastic search techniques. animation illustrates the response of the physical model of the dolphin to the emulator synthesized controller from the previous animation. The goal of our work is to support auralization of spatialized sound based on real-time acoustic modeling in interactive virtual environments. The main challenge in acoustic modeling is to compute the reverberation paths along which sound can travel from a source to a receiver and the sound can be spatialized by convolution with the impulse response derived from the delays, attenuations, and directivities of the computed reverberation paths. As a first example, consider computing specular reflections between a source and receiver in a simple box-shaped environment. In this visualization, the source is represented by a white dot, the receiver by a purple dot, and up to first-order specular reflection paths are shown as yellow lines. If we consider higher-order reflections or larger environments, computing reflection paths at interactive rates becomes more challenging. Previous acoustic modeling methods do not scale well with increasing numbers of reflections and geometric complexity, or they're not fast enough for real-time execution, and therefore they're not well suited for interactive virtual environments. The focus of our work is a beam tracing method that can compute high-order specular reflection paths in large environments fast enough to be used for auralization in interactive systems. So far we support specular reflection and transmission paths from fixed sources, as shown here. Execution of our method proceeds in four phases two pre-processing phases for spatial subdivision and beam tracing, and two interactive phases for path generation and auralization. During the first pre-processing phase, we construct a spatial subdivision data structure by partitioning 3D space into convex polyhedral cells and constructing an adjacency graph in which cells are linked if they share a convex polygonal boundary. During the second pre-processing phase, we trace convex pyramidal beams through the spatial subdivision from each sound source via a depth-first traversal of the cell adjacency graph. Each time a cell is visited, the convex polygon representing the traverse cell boundary is used to clip and possibly mirror the current beam along paths of transmission and specular reflection. We capture the recursion of this depth-first traversal in a beam tree data structure in which each node represents the beam-shaped region of space reachable from the source by a particular sequence of transmission and specular reflection events at cell boundaries. In the third phase, we compute reverberation paths from each source to a receiver point representing a user moving interactively through the virtual environment. Reverberation paths are found via lookup in the pre-computed beam tree by finding the set of beams that contain the receiver points, that is the ones that are shown here in green. For nodes containing such a beam, we can quickly determine the reverberation paths by looking up the sequence of transmission reflections encoded in the ancestors of the beam tree. In the final phase, we use the computed reverberation paths to construct binaural impulse responses, which encode the amplitudes and delays of signals reaching the ear from each source. We use the impulse responses to auralize anechoic audio signals in real time via software convolution. An advantage of this beam tracing method is that it scales well to support higher reflections in large virtual environments. The spatial subdivision generally scales linearly with global environment complexity, while the beam tracing and path generation computations grow only with local environment complexity. This example shows eighth-order specular reflections in an environment with 600 polygons. Here's a city environment with over 1,000 polygons and fourth-order specular reflection paths. In this building containing over 1,700 polygons, eighth-order specular reflection paths are computed eight times per second. Another advantage is that our method extends beyond direct propagation, transmission, and specular reflection to model paths of diffraction and diffuse reflection, which we have implemented in 2D so far. In this 2D architectural model, walls are represented by white lines. All possible direct paths from the yellow point are shown in gray. First order specular reflection paths are shown in red, second order, and third order. Transmission paths are green. Diffraction paths are blue around one edge, two edges, and three edges. 
Finally, first order diffuse reflection paths are shown in tan. In all cases, the pre-computed spatial subdivision enables rapid identification of the small subset of polygons to be considered during generation and intersection of each beam. We have integrated our acoustic modeling method into an interactive system for audiovisual exploration of virtual environments. In the following two sequences, we walk through the building shown here while simultaneously analyzing four audio sources and visualizing color-coded reverberation paths. Alexander Graham Bell was born on March 3, 1847, in Edinburgh, Scotland. It was in 1867, while teaching at Somersetshire College, like that he became interested in electricity and in It's collecting things having to do with monkeys. I'd like to tell you about one of my hobbies. It's collecting things having to do with monkeys. I'd like to tell you about one of my hobbies. It's collecting things. The second sequence shows the same walk from a bird's eye view with a moving view frustum shown in purple. Alexander Graham Bell was born on March 3, 1847, in Edinburgh, Scotland. It was in 1867 while teaching at Somersetshire College. I'd like to tell you about one of my hobbies. It's collecting things having to do with monkeys. I'd like to tell you about one of my hobbies. It's collecting things having to do with monkeys. I'd like to tell you about one of my hobbies. It's collecting... In summary, we have developed a method for computing high-order reverberation paths in large virtual environments at interactive rates. Our primary contributions are a scalable algorithm that traces convex beams through a spatial subdivision from each source along possible reverberation paths, and a beam tree data structure that enables interactive evaluation of reverberation paths to an arbitrary receiver location. We have incorporated these algorithms and data structures into a system that supports real-time auralization and visualization of large virtual environments. Most motion for animation, such as this motion capture data, only applies to a particular character. When used with a different character, important constraints on the motion are violated. Traditional per-frame methods can re-establish these constraints, but can also introduce undesirable frequency content. Our space-time constraints method re-establishes the important constraints on the motion, but limits the frequencies added. Limiting the frequencies too much creates overfitting, causing the wide, but very smooth, foot swings. Proper frequency limits produce better results. The same methods can adapt a motion to a character whose size is changing. In this example, we allow the solver to reposition the foot plants to create more natural stride lengths. This climbing example includes constraints on both the hands and feet. All of these constraints are violated when we apply the motion to a differently sized character. Our method can adapt the motion so the small character can climb the big ladder. We can also adapt the climbing motion when the character is changing size. This example shows ways that our methods fail to achieve acceptable results. The single simple frequency limit for all parameters causes undesirable twitches when different parameters have different needs. Also, the lack of balance and posture constraints can lead to unnatural motions. Swing dancing is a more successful example. The characters must stay on the floor and hold hands. Changing to a smaller female part violates the constraints. We can adapt the female's motion to re-establish the constraints, but she is not tall enough to remain connected to her partner in a natural way. 
We therefore allow our solver to adjust the motion of both characters. The male accommodates his new partner. Here, we compare the three motions. Adapting both motions allows the male to respond to changes in the female. Finally, we consider adapting a human skipping motion to a rigid can. First, we adapt the motion to a human with the proportions of the can. Next, we attach this altered motion to corresponding points on the can. Solving computes a motion for the can that mimics the human skipping motion. In this video, we present new techniques for synthesizing realistic facial expressions from photographs. We first photographed each facial expression using uncalibrated cameras. These photographs are then used to create a 3D model by specifying correspondences, recovering the camera parameters and face shape using an optimization technique. We can specify additional correspondences to help refine the geometry. Either points or curves can be specified on the facial mesh and input photographs. Here we draw curves along the right eyelid to improve the geometry of the mesh. We iterate this process until we are satisfied with the geometry. We then extract a texture map by projecting each image onto the reconstructed facial surface and then on a cylinder. The projected images are blended to produce the final texture map. Here's an example of a realistic fascia model we generated using these six images. We have also developed novel interactive techniques for generating complex expressions from a small set of initial expressions. By blending the geometry and texture map of the sadness expression with those of the surprise expression, we quickly generate a worried expression. To get more localized control, we split the face in several regions. Here we use just two. We can then create a misery expression by taking the mouth of the sadness expression and the eyes of the pain expression. The blend can be independently controlled for each region. To create a fake smile, we combine the mouth from a smiling expression with the eyes from a neutral expression. This more subtle expression can also be made quickly with separate regions. To obtain even finer control, we have developed a painting interface. This interface uses a palette of facial expressions, where each expression contributes both geometry and texture. To create a drunken smile, we begin with a neutral expression, and then paint the corners of the lips with a smile expression. By turning off the texture map, you can see that the smile expression affects the geometry as well as the texture. Now we'll raise the eyebrow by painting with a portion of the surprise expression. To get finer control, we shrink the size and reduce the opacity of the brush. We can then slightly lower the eyelids by painting with a closed eye expression. The blended expressions are used as keyframes in a 3D animation system. Once we generate an animation for one character, shown on the left, we can later reuse that same animation for another actor, shown on the right, without any additional user intervention whatsoever. Finally, here is a complete animation produced using these eight initial expressions. I was real happy and carefree and young, and I lived in a place called the Valley of Vung. And nothing, not anything ever went wrong until, well, one day I was walking along, and I guess I got careless. I guess I got gawking at daisies and not looking where I was walking. And that's how it started. Sock! What a shock! I stubbed my big toe on a very hard rock. And I flew through the air, and I went for a sail, and I sprained the main bone in the tip of my tail. Now, I never ever had troubles before, so I said to myself, I don't want any more. If I watch out for rocks with my eyes straight ahead, I'll keep out of trouble forever, I said. But watching ahead, well, it just didn't work. I was watching those rocks, then I felt a hard jerk. A very fresh, green-headed Quilligan quail sneaked up from in back and went after my tail. And I learned there are troubles of more than one kind. Some come from ahead, and some come from behind. So I said to myself, now, I'll just have to start to be twice as careful and be twice as smart. I'll watch out for trouble in front and back sections by aiming my eyeballs in different directions. I found this to be quite a difficult stunt, but now I was safe both in back and in front.
This paper describes how to build smooth parameterizations of triangular meshes of arbitrary connectivity and topology. We will describe our algorithm in three steps. Step one is hierarchy creation, and we use the Dobkin-Kirkpatrick pyramid to derive our base domain. Step two demonstrates the idea of parameterization remapping through the conformal mapping and constrained Delaunay triangulation. And step three presents a solution to solve the remeshing discontinuity problem. We conclude with an application of our algorithm to the adaptive remeshing of Venus. By combining the feature edges and feature points, the user is able to constrain the base domain to best fit the input mesh. Here we have a fan disk and its feature edges marked. We apply the Dobkin-Kirkpatrick algorithm to remove the maximal independent set vertices. The selection of maximal independent set vertices is based on the local curvature and local area. Thus, vertices at flat regions tend to be removed first, while sharp features will be kept in the coarser mesh. During the simplification procedure, the blue feature edges will be preserved under the constrained Lani triangulation. And here is our base domain. In order to compute the final parameterization, we propagate the associated information from the fine level to the coarse level. Here we have the center vertex that we want to remove and its one ring neighbors. Let's say there are three points associated with each face. By applying the z to the alpha map, its one ring neighbors together with the three points are projected onto a 2D plane according to their barycentric coordinates. We will then be able to perform constrained Delaunay triangulation on the 2D plane, and we can recompute the barycentric coordinates of the center point, the three points on each of the deleted faces with respect to the new faces. Applying the same procedure across each level in the Dobkin-Kirkpatrick pyramid will give us a parameterization of the input mesh with respect to a simple polyhedral domain. To remesh an input mesh with subdivision connectivity, we do a one to four split on each of the faces. The left remeshed fan disk is without smoothing. As we can see, it has the problem of discontinuity across the boundaries. To solve the problem, we define another mapping from the base domain to itself using the loop stencil in the parameter space. Thus, the dyadic points will be smoothed out before we apply the inverse mapping. The details are in the paper. The remesh looks nice and smooth. Finally, we demonstrate one of the applications of our algorithm, adaptive remeshing. On our left side is the original Venus, and the right-hand side is an adaptive remeshed Venus. The refining cr criterion is based on a conservative distance air bound described in the paper. Before presenting the details of our mesh modeling metaphor, we explain the general procedure of a sample mesh modeling session. To adapt the mesh complexity to the graphics performance of the available hardware resources, we apply mesh decimation prior to the interactive modeling. To the final model, we add back the detail. Since the position of the removed vertices has been encoded with respect to local frames, the result is a natural modification of the original mesh. Without caring about the underlying connectivity of the triangle mesh, the designer selects the support of the current modification by picking a sequence of points on the surface. The curve interpolating these points defines the boundary conditions for the edit. Another polygon is picked to specify the handle geometry. Handle plus boundary provide the means to define the modification characteristics since, when moving the handle, the surface will follow according to online bending energy minimization. Different results are achieved by changing the shape of the handle. Notice that any kind of transformation can be applied to the handle since the mesh within the modification area behaves like a clamped rubber skin. The constrained energy minimization, which controls the edit, requires the solution of a global sparse linear system. 
Plain Gauss side iterations do not converge fast enough due to the special eigenstructure of the corresponding iteration matrix. Adapting multigrid methods known from numerical analysis accelerates the computation so that several frames per second are achieved for moderately complex meshes. For more sophisticated modeling operations, it is not enough to guarantee the smoothness of the modified feature. Additionally, we want to preserve the structural detail. Our mesh modeling tool enables us to apply global deformations while preserving the detail information. Again, the designer defines the boundary of the area to be modified. In our case, we want to perform some lifting of the bust's face. For reasons of symmetry, we placed the handle around the nose. This gives us an intuitive and flexible interface for modifications. During interactive modeling, the detail is preserved and the real-time visual feedback gives an impression of modeling true rubber material. Since we do not have to bother with scalar valued basis functions, even complicated edits like scaling the nose lead to feasible modification of the detail features. Due to the underlying energy minimization, such transformations do not have to be handled differently from other interactions. Applying mesh decimation to the modification area provides a hierarchy of meshes with decreasing complexity. These meshes play the role of the different grids in a V-cycle multigrid solving scheme. After having computed the minimum energy surface, we restore the structural detail which has been subtracted previously. The local frame coding guarantees a reasonable reconstruction. The scene examples demonstrate how the presented mesh modeling technique can effectively perform complex edits of arbitrary triangle meshes while hiding the actual mesh connectivity from the designer. Algorithms to simplify complex polygonal models, like this bumpy torus model, are becoming fairly commonplace. The silhouette of the torus is maintained to within a few pixels of screen space deviation as we switch levels of detail. However, when we render in a solid shaded mode, the levels of detail have visible artifacts. These artifacts indicate error in the lit surface color. We will show how to use texture maps and normal maps, along with error bounds on texture coordinate deviation, to better preserve the overall appearance of the model. Let's begin with a look at the preservation of surface colors. The simplification process should not affect the colors of this lion model, because they are stored in a texture map, rather than at the model's vertices. But notice the texture distortions in the front legs and tail, as we turn on and off the use of levels of detail. These occur because we have measured only the surface deviation, but not the texture coordinate deviation. Let's take a closer look at the flat tail. It is possible to simplify the tail without producing any perceptible geometric deviation. However, we can see the distortion of the texture map as we toggle between the original surface and a simplified surface with two pixels of deviation of the surface's silhouette. We now add a new metric which bounds the screen space deviation of the texture coordinates. As we turn on and off the use of levels of detail, the deviations of both the silhouette and the texture are now limited to two pixels, placing the error of the surface color within the user's control. We now return to the bumpy torus model to focus on the preservation of surface normals. Normal vectors are typically stored with the model's vertices, so as we simplify the surface, our field of normals is simplified as well. This field of normals often requires a greater sampling rate than the surface itself, so the appearance of the surface suffers as we apply the geometric simplification. We can alleviate this problem by storing the normals in a normal map, much like the colors are stored in a texture map. The filtering of normals is now handled on a per pixel basis, and the shaded appearance is preserved. Again, our new metric limits both the surface and texture deviations, here set to four pixels in screen space. Normal maps are currently only available in certain prototype machines, such as PixelFlow, but they are likely to become available on commercial hardware in the next several years. Let's compare the two simplifications side by side. Notice that the normal map preserves the field of normals much more accurately than the per-vertex normals, using an equal number of fancier triangles. The difference between the original surface and the simplified surface with a normal map is nearly imperceptible.
Finally, we see a split-screen comparison of the complex armadillo model. As we toggle the levels of detail on and off with four pixels of deviation, we can see the quality benefits of using normal maps instead of vertex normals. We can increase the error to eight pixels and see an even greater difference. And next, we will allow 16 pixels of error. The model's tessellation is extremely low for its complex appearance using normal maps. To maintain this appearance while using per-vertex normals would require many more triangles. By using normal maps and texture maps, along with our new measure of texture coordinate deviation, we produce levels of detail with measurable quality. We preserve all the surface's visible attributes, truly preserving its appearance. The PixelFlow graphics system is capable of performing procedural shading at interactive rates of 30 frames per second. In this video, we will show live recordings of PixelFlow running several shaders written in our shading language, PFMan. Here we are using a shader exploration program to demonstrate a brick shader. We can manipulate the appearance parameters of the shader interactively to create just the look we want. Even if we tune the appearance parameters, the basic brick looks quite flat and unconvincing. We made a progression of changes to the shading code to improve the look of the brick. We will now add these changes in one by one. First, we add some noise to simulate graininess in the bricks and mortar. Since bricks in a wall are never all exactly the same color, we added some brick-to-brick -brick variation. Finally, we add some color variation across each brick. We adjust the scale of these variations to taste. We can also create procedural lights in PFMan. This light simulates sunlight shining through a paned window and is similar to one of the lights used in Pixar's Tin Toy. PFMan is based on Pixar's RenderMan shading language. The RenderMan shading code for this light is published in the RenderMan companion and was adapted to PFMan by one of our users. This highlights one of the advantages of using a high-level shading language. Its shaders are independent of the hardware or software rendering system. PixelFlow uses the same hardware for both rendering and shading. We can decide on an application by application basis how to distribute our resources. In this Mandelbrot Set Explorer, we have just a single polygon, but a very computationally expensive shader. If we use seven pixel flow nodes for rendering and only one for shading, our frame rate is quite poor. If instead we use only one pixel flow node for rendering and seven for shading, our performance is much better. It is easy to create time-varying procedural shaders. This is a mirror reflecting a chessboard scene. The chessboard was pre-rendered and stored as an environment map. By adding a procedural bump map to our mirror shader, we can create water-like ripples across the surface of the mirror.
Here we interactively place several drops to see the interference patterns between them. Procedural techniques, such as those we've demonstrated, are made possible not only by fast hardware, but also by a number of optimizations described in the paper. We believe that procedural shading and lighting add a valuable tool for interactive graphics. In this video, we show an idea and initial results for a system that captures information about everyday surfaces and then displays on those surfaces. To begin with, cameras and projectors are placed near the ceiling throughout the office. The cameras and projectors work together to imperceptibly calibrate and to extract a model of the visible surfaces within the room. The system can then display images on the surfaces in 2D or 3D for a head track user. In addition, multiple such offices at remote locations can exchange their geometry in real time so users can collaborate. Here we see the office in use with the five projector front projection system. Note that the user has more screen real estate and the users can move around. For each projector, we have a corresponding camera. The cameras are used in calibrating the system and for near real time depth extraction. Here we show that for a tracked video camera, the view of the real office as well as the virtual teapot changes, but the teapot remains registered with the real world. Our system uses the location of the viewer and the surface model of the room to generate prospectively correct images. Suppose we place a new object in the scene. The system projects as it did before, but now the discontinuity and depth will cause a sharp break in the image of the teapot. Our solution is to extract depth in the room using structured light patterns from the same projectors we use for display. After correcting for new depth values, the teapot will once again be displayed seamlessly, even across discontinuities in depth. In this segment, we demonstrate intensity blending. For a static viewer, we can blend images from multiple projectors to create a single seamless display. This involves geometric registration and intensity weighting four projector pixels. The result is that the two images are merged together seamlessly. Here, we turn one of the projectors off and then on again to highlight its contribution to the overall panorama. Finally, we move an occluder through the blended overlap region of two projectors to highlight each projector's contribution in that region. When we add a curved display surface, the projected image appears warped and also has intensity mismatches. We correct for these problems using structured light to perform depth extraction. Then, we can compute pre-warp functions and correct intensity weighting on a per pixel basis. The resulting projected image appears geometrically correct to a stationary viewer and due to intensity matching, it is seamless across the panorama. To see how our system works, first consider the case of conventional computer graphics. A three-dimensional object is projected down onto the flat view. As the user changes location, the view of the object changes as well. For our case, however, we must project onto a more complicated display, namely the room. Here we see the user viewing the teapot on a complicated surface of walls and a desk. Each projector covers only a small part of the entire display. A single projector's viewpoint is highlighted now in blue. For the first pass of our algorithm, we compute the desired viewer image with conventional computer graphics. That result, shown here, is then used as an OpenGL projective texture. In the second pass, the result of the first pass is effectively projected onto the display surface model. 
We then re-render the scene from the projector's viewpoint. That image, when displayed by the projector, will form the correct view for the user. Finally, we use structured light to create image-based models of human faces or display surfaces with multiple updates per second. The difficult problem of finding correspondences is reduced by projecting binary-coded vertical bars of light. This method simplifies depth extraction considerably. We aim to drive digital micro-mirror displays so fast that the structured light patterns are imperceptible to the human eye. The crucial benefit of imperceptibility is that we can interweave display and depth extraction. This will allow dynamic, real-time updates of the room geometry. In our paper, we present more details of our vision and our results. We believe the merger of real-time depth extraction with a spatially immersive display will prove to be a powerful tool for working alone on everyday tasks or in collaboration with others. The first component of our approach is to illuminate synthetic objects with real light. One method for recording light looking in all directions is to photograph a mirrored ball, such as this one, which sits on a kitchen table. Unfortunately, cameras lack the necessary dynamic range to make useful measurements of incident illumination. In this image, the light sources are completely saturated to white, making it impossible to gauge their intensity and color. We can recover accurate measurements of incident illumination using the high dynamic range photography technique presented by Debevic and Malik at SIGGRAPH 97. Using this technique, we can combine pictures with varying exposure times into a single representation that accurately records the intensity, color, and direction of all forms of direct and indirect illumination. Once the incident illumination is recorded, it can be used to illuminate synthetic objects with a global illumination algorithm, such as Greg Larson's Radiance system. This rendering shows a collection of objects with a wide variety of material properties illuminated by the light from the kitchen. The objects properly reflect each other and exhibit the appropriate soft shadows, reflections, and caustics. Using a different map of incident illumination gives a different quality of light to the objects. This illumination, shown in the upper left, was acquired on an overcast day beneath an outdoor trellis. We can construct a simple light-based model of the kitchen by projecting the recovered radiance values onto a geometric model of the room. This allows us to place the synthetic objects into the same space as the original environment. In this animation, we see the synthetic objects placed within and illuminated by the light-based model of the kitchen environment. While the light-based model is low resolution and suffers from uneven sampling, we can begin to sense the objects existing within the same space as the kitchen. Here we can observe the same objects illuminated by the overcast outdoor environment. This next animation shows a different series of objects illuminated by the kitchen environment. Here the high dynamic range nature of the renderings is accentuated for visual effect through a combination of duotone mapping, image defocus, and artificial vignetting. This last animation shows a collection of synthetic objects rendered with light recorded at the Eucalyptus Grove on the UC Berkeley campus. The environment used was created from two light probe measurements taken 90 degrees apart to provide even sampling and to remove the appearance of the camera. To be fully general, it is necessary to not just illuminate the synthetic objects with the appropriate light, but to have the objects cast the appropriate shadows and reflections in the scene. Suppose, for example, that we wanted to render our synthetic objects onto this background plate photograph of a table. We first use a calibration target to record the camera pose relative to the scene and acquire a light probe measurement in the vicinity of where the synthetic objects will go. As before, we use a simple light-based model of the environment to extrapolate incident illumination conditions. The camera pose and lighting information allow us to render the objects into the scene with the correct perspective and illumination. In order to cast reflections and shadows on the scene, a stand-in for the local scene of the objects is created. In this case, the local scene is a rectangular patch of the table. Methods discussed in the paper were used to estimate the local scene's material properties. Unfortunately, the local scene is not a convincing rendition of the table. Because both its material properties and incident illumination are only estimates, its appearance is not consistent with the distant scene. We can improve the consistency using differential rendering. In differential rendering, we first render the local scene illuminated by the light-based model without the synthetic objects. We compare this appearance to the previous rendering to isolate the effect of adding the objects, creating a difference image. Dark areas in the difference image indicate where the objects create shadows, and bright areas indicate where the objects create reflected or focused light. Finally, we use this difference image to modify the background plate. In this case, the result is visually consistent with the existing background, despite the approximated material properties and incident illumination of the local scene.
the conventional definition of range images for image-based rendering, each image has a single center of projection associated with it, as shown here in red. We extend this concept of an image to what we call multiple center projection images. A multiple center projection image consists of a single bitmap, but one whose pixels were not all acquired from the same viewpoint. Instead of a single camera, we have a sequence of cameras lying on either a curve or a surface. As we sweep along this curve, we capture very thin image slices of the scene from each point on the path. These slices are concatenated into the final image buffer shown above. The image on top is our new multiple center of projection image. We can clearly see that this image was created from multiple vantage points. We also store the range at each point in our image, as well as the camera parameters for each pixel. We can then reproject the image back into 3Space. Since we know adjacent points in our image were captured by adjacent cameras, we can also connect them with triangles. This would be difficult to do with an unorganized set of points. Note that this single image captures all sides of the castle in a way that planar images or even inward-looking cylinders cannot. Here's another model. It demonstrates our method's ability to sample different portions of a scene at different resolutions using only a single image. Here we show the multiple center projection image being acquired from this model. And now we reproject. In this single reference image, we sampled the fore and after the ship at a higher resolution than the midsection, giving us greater detail at these places. We also sampled the flag at the rear of the ship at a very high resolution, allowing an extreme close-up of this small portion of the data set. A fundamental concept in computer vision and image-based rendering is the epipolar geometry induced by a pair of images. For two conventional images, A and B, the epipolar image of A in B is the image of rays from camera A as seen by camera B. Given a three-space point imaged by A, we know that if that point is also seen by the second image, then it must lie along the projection of the corresponding ray from the first image. A multiple center projection image has the unique property of inducing a series of epipolar images with itself. Given one of the end cameras of the image, we can project rays out from it into 3Space and then capture these rays by every other camera. Here we show in yellow the rays projected by a single camera, in green the negative rays projected by that camera, and in blue we show every other camera as it receives these rays. This traces a series of curves shown in the above inset. Given a three-space point seen at pixel location P, we now know that if that point is found elsewhere in the image, it will be found along the epipolar curve induced by a ray through P. Thus, we can use a single image to perform point correspondence. In this video, we will introduce an image-based approach for re-rendering architectural scenes under novel lighting conditions. This video has two parts. In the first part, we will explain how our approach works. In the second part, we will show some sequences generated using this approach. 
our approach uses data from photographs to recover the reflectance and illumination conditions of surfaces in the architecture. The recovered reflectance and illumination models are used to re-render the scene under new lighting conditions. In order to recover the reflectance, we calculate a mathematical property called pseudo-BRDF. We model the sun as a parallel light source. To model the rest of the illumination, we use a sky radiance model and a landscape radiance model. To recover a sky radiance model, we need to take multiple photographs of the sky, including the zenith and the part of the sky near the horizon. Since there may be occluding objects in the sky photographs, we interactively choose some sky regions from each photograph. A sky model can then be recovered by a least square procedure. In most of the regions, the data fitting error is within 5%. To recover the landscape radiance model, we use a similar procedure except that we partition the landscape into a number of small regions and recover a distinct radiance model for each region. They are shown here as a set of tiles. Both the sky and landscape radiance models can be seen in this spherical map. To recover the reflectance, we also need the radiance values reflected from the architecture. We can get these values from photographs of the architecture and assign them to their corresponding polygons. This assignment requires visibility processing to determine which polygons are visible from each photograph. To model the reflectance, we need to recover two sets of pseudo-BRDFs. One set is used for the sun, the other is for the sky and landscape. The first set of pseudo-BRDFs needs photographs which are only lit by the sun. The second set requires photographs that are not lit by the sun. We recovered diffuse and specular pseudo-BRDFs separately. For most of the architectures, reflection is dominated by a diffuse component. In order to capture its spatial variation, we set up a dense grid on each face in the geometric model and recovered diffuse pseudo-BRDFs at each grid point. In order to produce novel lighting conditions, we interpolate previously recovered illumination models. We will now show four sets of sequences generated using our approach. This sequence compares the actual photographs with our synthetic images. The synthetic images are on the left, while the actual photographs are on the right. This sequence shows the architecture at two different times on a sunny day from various viewpoints. This sequence shows the architecture under clear, intermediate, and overcast skies. This sequence shows the architecture at various times of a sunny day near the end of August.
In this video and accompanying paper, we will discuss new algorithms and data structures for fast image-based rendering. In particular, we will show how to quickly render sprites containing depth information at each pixel. We will also introduce a new data structure called a layered depth image, or LDI. What you see now are frames rendering in real time from a PC using no specialized graphics hardware from a single layered depth image. Before explaining the LDI structure, we will begin with a discussion of sprites derived from real photographic images. The images you see here are 5 out of 40 that were taken simultaneously with a specialized multi-lens camera developed by Dayton Taylor. The sprites and their associated plane equations were extracted from the five source images using a layered motion estimation technique. The black areas of the sprites are the result of occlusions. Now, we're going to render the sprites in 3D. Each sprite represents a plane in 3D, and you can see the parallax between the layers of sprites. You are now looking at a simple sprite with a checkerboard texture. Rotating the sprite, you can see that it is planar. Given a depth value associated with each pixel, and using the rendering method discussed in the paper, you can see the hemisphere in the plane pop out. The illusion for a smooth object like this is convincing, and barely slows down the rendering. Here is the first demonstration of layered depth images. In this scene, we have pre-rendered 20 depth images with cameras that encircle the chicken. As we move the camera around, the three closest depth images to our viewpoint are chosen and warped into a single layer depth image that is then rendered to the screen. This is implemented as two threads on a multiprocessor, one thread creating the LDIs from the depth images and the other rendering images from the current LDI. As we move around, you'll see bits of the scene pop into view. This happens when we have moved enough that a new input image is added to the LDI being rendered. When we dolly in towards the chicken, you can see the splats separate. This happens because we used a maximum splat size of 5 pixels square, and adjacent samples of the chicken surface have spread apart more than 5 pixels. Another way of constructing a layered depth image is to use photographs of real-world objects. This toy dinosaur was constructed from computer vision techniques that compute pixel correspondences to directly fill an LDI data structure. This LDI has 58,000 depth pixels. You can notice a wave running through the picture. This is due to the fact that there are no normals for this data set, so the splat size calculation is dependent solely on distance. Here's a layered depth image constructed using a ray tracer. We can pan back and forth and change the focal length of the camera, just like in a system such as QuickTime VR. However, since we store a depth per pixel, we can also translate the camera, and you can see there's a great deal of parallax induced by the camera motion. This is simply a depth image, or a layered depth image with only one layer. So, you can see lots of holes in the tree due to occlusions. As the camera is dollied toward the tree, the three-dimensional structure of the LDI is very apparent. Here is the same tree. It is a more densely sampled LDI, having 800,000 depth pixels. We can dolly into the tree and look around. Even though the splats have gotten large, the sense of the shape of the tree and the illusion of immersion are still very good. It is interesting to selectively disable the two segments of the LDI. Here, we have disabled the front segment and can see the inside of the tree from a distance. Now, if we enable the front segment and disable the back segment, we see just the leaves and the rendering is much faster. Lastly, we show the accurate tree again with an environment map of the terrain near Mount St. Helens. The environment map can be rendered in software very quickly, at 25 to 30 frames per second, so we get it essentially for free. Sprites with depth and layered depth images provide an effective and efficient means to leverage captured images and complex rendered environments without the need for expensive dedicated graphics hardware. To create a plant ecosystem, first a terrain has to be modeled, which includes the distribution of resources like, for example, water. Accordingly, the species of a mountain meadow distribute. In this meadow, approximately 100,000 plants take place, which a total amount of over 2 billion geometric primitives like polygons and cylinders.
Now we show how plants of this scene were modeled by using our interactive plant modeler XFROG. First we start with an apple tree. The modeler offers three windows. One shows the generated geometry. Here the structural description is edited and this window is used for animating models. The user selects components from a given toolbox. Some are used for generating geometry, some for multiplying other components. In this case, a tree component is used and combined with the camera symbol. The resulting geometry is a generalized cylinder. Another component is selected and combined with the first one by using a branching link. This results in a first tree model. By double clicking on the component the parameters can be changed. In this case the number of branching twigs is increased. The components offers various other parameters which trigger for example the branching angle, the distribution of branches or the amount of gravitational prism applied to the twigs. After fixing the parameters, the tree looks like this. Adding the texture and another level of twigs results in a natural looking tree. Finally, the leaves are added. Similarly, the stinging nettle is generated. In this case, 12 components are used. Here we show the three-dimensional result. Now the population is distributed by using this grayscale image as described in the paper. A GL preview is used during modeling. After the whole ecosystem is created, it is easy to animate.
two avatars are bicycling through a virtual environment made of a 3D region and a video region. We are now viewing the world from the yellow avatar's point of view. When the red cyclist moves into the video region, he will remain visible because a trace object replaces his avatar. The trace object is scaled and translated so that it appears to be moving in the 3D space represented by the video panel. As we go behind the scenes, we see a white avatar, which has been added in this demonstration to show the lead cyclist's actual position. From the yellow avatar's point of view, the red cyclist's representation changes seamlessly between a trace object and an avatar. Since image and video regions represent parts of a 3D space, these 2D displays should maintain visual continuity with their surrounding objects, regardless of viewing location. Each of these screens shows the same image from various viewpoints. In the left screen, the image is displayed on a flat panel, while in the right screen, it is displayed on a pyramidic panel. From this viewpoint, the image on the left has severe discontinuities with the surrounding 3D road curves while the right image fits much better. This new view emphasizes discontinuities between the left image's horizon and its surrounding model. Again, the right image maintains continuity. As our viewpoint approaches the panels, we see an unintelligible collection of pixels in the left image, but retain our sense of space in the right image. When we look to the side, the image on the right retains its continuity with the surrounding 3D objects. As we move far forward, our viewpoint goes through the flat panel, but the pyramidic panel accommodates this viewpoint. Let's watch the sequence again. This time, Two screens have been added to give us behind-the-scenes views of the flat and pyramidic panels, showing how they respond to camera movements. The lower right screen shows how the pyramidic panel responds to viewpoint movements. Notice that the apex of the pyramid maintains a fixed distance from the camera. The differences we see between the images displayed on the flat panels and those on the pyramidic panels result solely from these responses to the camera's position. Of course, pyramidic panels work equally well for the display of video images. As the panels move along the road, their speeds match the changing contents of the video. In addition, the pyramidic panel responds to user viewpoint changes thus maintaining visual continuity between the video and surrounding 3D objects. We continue to look around for other effects.
Wires are a geometric deformation technique where objects are controlled by a set of curves. the curves as we reshape the wires and how deformation from multiple wires integrate in a seamless and controlled manner. The use of locators in providing finer parameter control and to incorporate an interpolated twist along the wire is also shown. ...like behavior. Note the rubber band-like behavior on increasing flexibility and the volume preservation that results by using the length of the skeleton to control the wire scale parameter. Here we show the use of a domain curve to refine the drop-off around a wire. Smooth integration of deformation from multiple wire curves is shown here. Note the spike in the middle as we blend into a simple superposition of the individual deformations. The use of the exponent M to adjust the tension on the surface in the region where the wires interact can also be seen. The curtain in this clip is driven by a dynamic simulation run on a set of wire curves. The curves decouple the complexity and parameterization of the object surface from the simulation, making it more efficient and easier to control. Wire technique is an integral part of the 3D modeling and animation system Maya.
This video demonstrates a method for applying complex textures to characters in cell animation. In traditional cell animation, moving figures such as this bouncing ball are shaded with flat constant colors. In contrast, background scenery is illustrated in high detail. In this project, we show how detailed textures such as the stripes of this beach ball may be attached to animated figures. This clip would be difficult to create using traditional animation because the texture of the ball would have to be drawn individually for each frame. The process begins with hand-drawn artwork. Hand-drawn artwork has an emotional impact and subtlety of character that's difficult to achieve with 3D computer graphics. Next we create a simple 3D model with a texture map. The model should have approximately the same shape as the animated figure. Our program distorts the shape of the model to conform to each frame of the hand-drawn bouncing ball. Finally, the texture is extracted from the model and composited with the original line art over background scenery. Here's the same artwork with a different texture map. Once we have the correspondence between the model and the artwork, it's easy to use any other texture. Now let's look at a more complex character, a carpet slithering down a stairwell. Here's a 3D model of the carpet with an elaborate texture affixed to it. We distort the model to conform to each frame of the hand-drawn carpet. We use a warp that distorts the model in the image plane so that it aligns with hand-drawn artwork. The warp preserves depth information to allow for 3D effects such as changes in occlusion and foreshortening. This also permits us to slide the texture back and forth over the horizon. Here's the resulting animation, complete with background. In this final example, we look at a hand-drawn fish. We use a simple 3D model of the fish. The model doesn't change from frame to frame except for rotation. The fins and eyes are rendered as separate elements. They're composited using a transparency mask together with the fish body and the background to produce the final animation. This concludes our video. We demonstrate a new technique for painting from a photograph. A painting is built up in a series of layers. We begin by painting a rough sketch with a large brush. We then paint over the sketch with progressively smaller brush strokes, but only in areas where the paintings differ from the source image. The paintings shown here contain brush strokes of three different sizes. Long curved brush strokes are created by following the normals of image gradients in the source image. Please see the paper for details of the painting algorithm. The algorithm contains several parameters that determine the appearance of the painting. By changing the value of these parameters, we produce different styles of painting. Here we demonstrate painting in an expressionistic style. These painting styles have a consistent appearance when applied to different source images. This demo was created in real time on an SGI Infinite Reality. This demo was written in C++ and OpenGL and takes advantage of Z-buffering hardware. Each painting takes about two seconds or less. Note that a different version of the software written in Java was used to produce the rest of the images in this video and the images in the paper. We now show paintings in continuously varying rendering styles. We have defined four painterly styles as different sets of parameters to the painting algorithm. By linearly interpolating their parameter values, we generate a continuous sequence of paintings in intermediate styles. Here the image begins as impressionistic, and then slowly becomes expressionistic. Colorist wash, puntillist, and then impressionistic again. Each frame in this sequence was rendered independently, 
no attempt was made to produce temporal coherence. We now show video sequences processed in an impressionistic style. These video sequences were first captured with a Hi8 video camera at locations around New York's Times Square and in the East Village. This movie is shown at the normal video rate, 30 frames per second. One method for painting video sequences is to process each video frame separately. However, this process produces a distracting flickering effect. To reduce this effect and to improve temporal coherence, we begin each frame by painting over the last frame of the animation, rather than starting with a blank canvas each time. While this technique is not as effective as a more sophisticated optical flow algorithm could be, it is very simple to implement and is fast to compute since relatively few brushstrokes are rendered for each frame.